Good morning, everybody, uh, and a happy Sunday to you. My name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here at Moody Methodist Church and pastor at The Bridge Online, uh, coming to you online today. Um, as many of you know, because of the stuff happening in our world, in our country, in our local community surrounding COVID-19, uh, we and many others have had to move uh, all things online uh, to protect the most vulnerable um, to this disease among us. Um, out of honor to that, we're doing that as well. That's why we're not meeting in person today. Um, but we'll still continue to worship together, uh, utilizing this new online kind of format. Um, so bear with us as we begin to figure these things out. But we're really excited um, about some of the new opportunities that are coming out of this. I'm really grateful, too, to Barry, who's back there, and Brian, who have really helped work all week to get not only Sunday set up, uh, but a couple of other offerings that we're going to be doing this week. Uh, let me take a second to tell you about some of them. Um, we will be producing content uh, all week for you all, as many of us are uh, doing this new thing called social isolation, where we're keeping to ourselves, we're keeping our band even, appropriately six feet apart uh, as well. Um, but we want to still be able to uh, reach you and be able to do things like spiritual formation and provide content um, for all of our members and children as well. And so you can go this week to Moody dot org slash online uh, and all there will house our worship services that we have uh, Monday Pastor Jerry will be every Monday giving a little address to everybody I'll be doing a Bible study um, every week we'll have some fun classes as well um, story time for kids Miss Margarita is planning Zoom, uh, Zoom uh, for the kids in you know, pre-K all the way to fourth grade. And Matthew and Derek have been preparing stuff for our youth to continue to meet together. Um, so that despite this crisis, we will find ways to stay connected online. Um, again, moody.org slash online will house most of that. Um, and we'll be sending out information. Um, we've sent it to you already and we'll continue to send it out on our Facebook and um, through email uh, to how to access all of that stuff and our schedule of all of this online programming we'll be doing. Um, we hope that we can uh, continue to be a church together. Um, if you know any needs that you might have or needs in your community, uh, we'll still be available by phone and email through the week, and we have uh, some of our staff manning that. Uh, please reach out to us and let us know uh, how we can continue to be the church to one another. Uh, just because we can't meet in person doesn't mean that our work won't continue. Um, it'll just look a bit different. Uh, with that said, we're still uh, going to worship today, and we have music um, and sermons um, and other things still planned for you um, for the time ahead. Um, typically, right now is when I would go and uh, invite up our kids, but we have no kids here with us. Um, tried to get Brary to bring uh, his baby, but he said no. Um, and I know that uh, you and maybe your families are watching together, so we still want to have this children's kind of moment. Um, and, and I want to say, too, to all of our kids as well, that despite the fact that you can't sit up here with me um, and go off to children's church in that place that you know. It doesn't mean that we uh, aren't continuing to worship together. Uh, we'll just use technology like your parents' phones or an iPad that you have, uh, and we'll be together digitally. Um, and there are probably ways that you can begin to care for your neighbors and help them, maybe some of your grandparents or great-grandparents or some of the older people in their community. Um, but friends, one of our customs here is to pray for our kids, and we're still going to do that. So I'm going to invite all of you watching with us to extend a handout as we normally do. And let's say a prayer um, for all of our kids throughout uh, the internet here um, and the way in which they give, uh, give to us and teach us about God. Um, so let's pray. Uh, holy God, uh, we give thanks uh, for all of our kids. Uh, we give thanks that they have opportunities to begin to meet digitally and still be connected to one another. Uh, we pray in this time uh, for Miss Margarita and Miss Penny uh, as they adapt their lessons to be able to stay connected online. Uh, we pray the times that they had um, before this service and on Fridays uh, will be a time of joy for them where they can learn more about you and your love for them. Uh, we continue to pray for them over the next coming weeks and give thanks for the way in which they teach us about God. And we say all of these things in your son's name. Amen. Stay. 
Again, uh, we are continuing our service of worship. Um, before we come to our scripture, uh, I want to say that if you are still able um, and wanting to respond uh, through our giving of tithe and offering, uh, since we can't meet in person and you know pass the plate as we normally do, uh, I want to point you to two ways that you can continue to do that. Um, uh, one way is just through mail. Um, you can write your check or send cash in the mail uh, if you so desire. Uh, you can also go um, to moody.org slash giving. Uh, the link should pop up down below. Um, and you can uh, set up an online gift there, a one-time or reoccurring donation. Uh, one thing we want to mention, too, is uh, in addition as a response to all that's happening in our community. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, we're beginning, uh, we're beginning to produce uh, content online for all of us to continue kind of our spiritual formation practices of Bible study and uh, 
time together, small groups, and those sorts of things. Um, but we're also monitoring how we can best be uh, a presence for our community and for people in our community. Uh, one of the things we're doing as a response is we're taking our Lenten offering as well as some other margin uh, within our budget, thanks to the giving that you've done this year, um, to designate that as a response uh, towards COVID-19. Uh, Lance and his efforts through the Society of St. Stephen's will coordinate some of that, um, but to the best of our ability, we will do our best to respond to people who are in need uh, around maybe issues like uh, utilities, um, rent, food, uh, prescriptions, um, whatever that may be. Um, if that is something you're willing to uh, to contribute towards, uh, we are facilitating that effort. Um, that will also take place in that same um, area, moody.org slash giving, and you can just look towards our Lenten offering or the Society of St. Stephen's um, gifts you make there will be used uh, for the foreseeable future toward that effort. Uh, we give thanks for the ways that you give, whether it is of your money, your time, um, your service, there are lots of ways that we do that, uh, not out of obligation, um, but out of the graciousness of the God who is first given to us. Uh, if you would, let's say a prayer before we begin. Uh, Holy God, uh, we give thanks for this time to gather together uh, as an online worshiping community. Uh, we pray for all of us out here as we connect uh, on Sunday, or maybe we connect later in the week because of what we've got going on, um, but we give thanks that we can stay connected. Uh, we pray for us as your church. Empower us to continue to serve one another, uh, to continue to be a blessing to one another. Uh, may the gifts that we receive be best used uh, in response uh, to the crisis that is ongoing in our community. Uh, throughout the people of God's 2,000-year uh, history, um, Christianity has known uh, how to respond to disease and to crisis with a calm and peaceful and loving presence. May your grace empower us to do that with one another this morning and beyond. Amen. Well, if you all uh, have your Bibles with you, and hopefully since you're at your home now, uh, you probably have one sitting on the shelf, and I'm going to encourage you uh, to grab that, um, maybe dust it off if you need. Uh, if you typically use your phone or something else for a Bible, uh, you can utilize that. Uh, but I really encourage you to grab your Bible and follow along with me today and turn this morning to Jeremiah chapter 29. Uh, we're going to read this passage in just a second, um, but while you're turning there, I want to mention uh, and just say a couple of things. Um, because I was thinking, you know, we are about halfway into our 40-day journey of Lent, um, probably a little over halfway in. Um, but as we take this journey together, I, I was thinking about all the various Lents that have come before this, um, where I have given something up, um, given something up for the sake of trying to make life a little uncomfortable. And, you know, I was praying, uh, Lord, you didn't have to make us this kind of uncomfortable this week. Um, but as we realize kind of now and going forward, things are not the way uh, that they normally are. Uh, it's a time of real fear, um, especially for those in our community who are most vulnerable. Um, it's a time that is making us uncomfortable. Um, it's a time that's difficult for people in our community who are experiencing homelessness, uh, people in our community who are in the hospitality, the restaurant, and the service industry, um, people whose work has just grinded to a standstill. And we face fears of scarcity. Um, we worry about will there be enough for us. Uh, I read a headline the other day, I jotted it down, uh, that read, crisis like this often brings out the worst in people. Um, the, the, we've talked about this before. I, I mentioned this before. You may, met or, uh, you may remember, but one of my favorite Old Testament scholars uh, writes this great uh, piece about the myth of scarcity that goes all the way back even to the Bible um, with characters like Pharaoh who are trying to hoard the resources of the community. Um, we see that today as people are hoarding things like toilet paper and uh, trying to store up six, eight years worth of food in one go. Um, but we also have very real fears, right? We have fears of financial impact, um, not just in our church, um, but in our school, government, 
small business, in life. Uh, we have fears over how this is impacting so many levels of society, right? Uh, we're in uncertain time, and we're praying that this won't last long. Um, I know we're hoping that we can be back together sooner rather than later. I'm hoping I can get one more uh, face-to-face with you all uh, before our kid is born. Um, but we were thinking, you know, maybe the next time you see us in person, Diana and I uh, will have a child to show you. Um, so we'll do some show and tell with that. Um, but there are other estimates that say this can last as long as 18 months or uh, a really long time. Uh, we look to leaders. Um, I know for us as a, a leadership team that this was a dif- uh, difficult decision um, not to be meeting face to face and to move everything online. Um, I know as I've called and talked to some of you that you've expressed your disappointment to not be with us and I understand, I wish we could break the rules. Um, Uh, and ask for forgiveness instead of permission. Um, uh, This is a difficult season for us, and we're thinking about the impact. We're thinking about what do we do. And I know that there is fear and frustration um, for our global leaders, um, that there are those who are working diligently in the field of medicine, and they're trying to strategize about how to best uh, do in this time and operate. Uh, So it is a weird and unique and challenging time for us. And now I have to confess too, as I was thinking about, okay, what in the world am I going to say to you? uh, Well, none of you are here, but to you out there on Facebook this week. um, And there was a text that I preached back in Advent um, that I kept coming to. And I don't say this lightly, but as I prepared and thought about uh, what in the heck am I going to say, I kept coming back to the key message of this text in Jeremiah 29 again and again and again. And I really believe that God was leading me to share this with you. Uh, If you remember, the book of Jeremiah was written in a weird time in Israel's history, uh, in this season they call exile. Uh, There was a first exile, you may remember, that took place in the book of Exodus with Moses, and uh, they're under the reign of Egypt, and and God delivers them out of Egypt through the waters of the Red Sea and, and out into this new and uncharted territory. So he gets them out of exile the first time. Uh, But as the story continues, the people begin to establish, and they decide to to establish a king. And and in Israel's history, you may remember, there were three kings in Israel's history, Saul, David, and Solomon, in this united kingdom of Israel. Uh, But it was Saul, the third king, who really ruined kingship for everybody, Uh, and it it essentially ruined the nation of Israel, and they ended up splitting in two. Uh, Ten tribes went to the north um, and remained up there, and two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, stayed in the south and kept Jerusalem as their capital. Um, Ultimately, those ten tribes were were lost and were conquered by the nation of Assyria, and the people were dispersed and never really recovered. Uh, But there was a key moment, and we've talked about this some before, you may remember, um, when Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar in the year 587 uh, come and they conquer Jerusalem um, and they bring the people into their second exile. Um, Instead of bringing them into slavery like Pharaoh did, uh, they take all the people in Jerusalem and and bring them back to Babylon and scatter them through other parts of the region. And this gets known as the second exile. Uh, It was a really key date in Israel's history. But about 10 years before that, in five, uh, that date in 587, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the armies of Babylon came to Jerusalem, and they took the best and the brightest, right? Um, imagine, I've always likened it to this, right? When we're in elementary school and it's recess and we're playing kickball, and we're picking teams, right? And we pick the two kind of stud muffins to be captains of the team. And, and they are picking the best and the brightest on the recess field, right? There's the guy who, though he's in sixth grade, he looks like he could be a teenager. And, you know, he's already six foot one, six foot two. And then there's uh, the girl who has played soccer since she could walk and she can already kick the kickball over uh, anybody's head in the outfield, right? Those are the best people that we are picking first. And, and so Nebuchadnezzar does something similar. And he takes the best and the brightest in Jerusalem. They're smartest people, they're, they're scientists, they're medicine people, they're, they're hard workers. Um, and he takes them back to Babylon. 
And so those people are in Babylon, and they're in a new place that they've never been before. And they're starting to wonder what life is going to be like. They're starting to wrestle with being in this new place. They're starting to wrestle with what they should be doing, and they don't know how long this is going to last. And so here we have this people in exile, and they find themselves in uncharted territory. They find themselves in a time of upheaval, a time of living in fear and threat, and they're worried about the vulnerable in their community that they left back in Jerusalem. They're worried about family members that are far away from them that they maybe can't go see, and they're running short on the things that they need to sustain life, and their fear of scarcity might be causing them to hoard resources in a little bit, and they're wondering about how long this lasts, and they are frustrated, and they're ready to get rid of leaders, and they're frustrated with God. I mean, are we having a hard time figuring out how to relate this text to our own moment? Um, this is the moment that you can laugh. I'll let you go ahead and do that. Uh, because we are living in a time of unfamiliarity, um, into stuff that's unfamiliar from us. And so in the midst of all of this turmoil, in the midst of all of this frustration, God, the frustration at one another, frustration with their situation. Uh, here, Jeremiah writes this beautiful pastoral letter to those people to try to speak words of hope to a people wondering what are they supposed to be doing in a new and foreign way of life. Uh, so let me go ahead and read that to you now. We're going to start at verse 1 and go through verse um, 13, or verse 14, actually. Um, and go ahead and follow along if you have your Bible out. If not, we'll put it on the screen down here. But, uh, but these are the words of God um, to Jeremiah 2,500 years ago, uh, but to you and I today. It goes like this. Uh, these are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles and to the priests and prophets and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. All this was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the court officials, and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, and the artisan and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of uh, Eliasson, son of Shepdan, and Gamera, son of Hilkiah, whom King Zedekiah of Judah sent to Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. It said, and here's the good stuff, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens, eat what they produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, uh, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie they are prophesying to you in my name, and I did not send them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you and will I fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for your harm, to give you a future with a hope. When you call on me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Uh, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Uh, now, what I want to do with our last bit of time this morning 
uh, is to walk through this prophetic pattern that shows up in the text here. Uh, Because I think there's something beautiful. In the same way God spoke uh, to these people through this text uh, 2,500 years ago, uh, God is still speaking to us, speaking to our situation today through this. Uh, But you'll notice, uh, and maybe you noticed as we read it, but God was inviting the people um, into a couple of particular and peculiar things to do that. The first thing that God was inviting the people to do uh, was to have patience. Uh, Look with me back at verse 10 and 11 of this. Uh, Let me reread it for you. It goes like this. For thus says the Lord, Only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you and will I fulfill my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord plans for your welfare and not for harm, but to give you a future and a hope. Uh, Jeremiah here, I think, is inviting the people into a kind of peaceful pragmatism. Um, He's inviting them to be patient, to have patience with their situation. Uh, That exile that they had ended up lasting 70 uh, years. And and Jeremiah's invitation with them was to be patient, to say, hey man, uh, this may take a little bit of time, right? It's not a thing that you can wait out in a couple of days. It's going to be a little bit of time. Uh, This is, I think, a hard one to hear, to have patience in our situation, Um, especially if you're like me and are a big extrovert and just love people. Um, I've been certainly bothering, six feet apart though, um, everybody who has been coming into the office this past week um, because I need my fix of people. Uh, Certainly, I miss being with you all and and have just now realized truly how much I enjoy our time of fellowshipping before and after the service, uh, getting to catch up, getting to hear how your life is going. Um, I'm even instinctively looking out to where you would be. Um, I need to print pictures of your faces. Um, But it becomes difficult to have that kind of patience. Um, Introverts, I know you are set for the next couple of years, um, and you'll have to teach us how to do that. Um, But amidst the difficulty of our situation, I think God invites us to be patient. We may be tempted to want to just go out to say, why can't I go to a restaurant? Why can't I bring um, six of my friends with me? Why can't I do this? Um, But the patience that we have now uh, saves the lives of the vulnerable down the road. And I think that's such an important message for us today, to be patient, Um, especially in what we do now uh, helps those later on. And sometimes the best way that we can love someone in this unique situation is to not embrace them, but to embrace patience and embrace that separation. Um, Not so much isolation, that's a difficult word that we've been hearing. Um, but our intentional physical separation from one another. Um, That's one of the ways I think God is inviting us to participate in a redemptive work in the midst of this. Uh, When we can intentionally isolate, uh, again, not isolate, sorry. When we can intentionally separate ourselves physically um, from one another, um, especially for the sake of those in our community who are most vulnerable. So we're invited to have patience in this really trying time. Uh, but next we're also caught, uh, invited, sorry, we're invited to be hopeful. Uh, Jeremiah invites us to have a really hopeful vision where we are uh, wrapped up in God's promise and that we would live into that promise and we would be sustained by God's presence. Um, In those next verses, right after that, 12 and 13, let me reread those. It goes like this. Uh, God says to the people, when you call upon me, when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. Uh, When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, uh, I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Now, here too, God is inviting us, right, in that last verse. We're invited to be patient. Uh, But here God invites us to be hopeful in in what it is God is doing. Uh, But it's also important to note that God is not absent. 
Uh, For the people in Jeremiah's time, right, God's not saying that, okay, I'm going to leave you for seven decades. Um, I've got this thing to attend to. I'm going to socially isolate myself from all of you. Uh, I'll see you later, right? I'll see you in 70 years. I'll see your kids and grandkids, right? No, Uh, God is saying that even in the midst of this time, uh, I have not left you. That in these 70 years, when you call on me, if you need me, I will be here with you. And I think God offers that same promise of hope to you and to I today. You might be wrestling with or frustrated or asking where God is in the midst of this. But I think the word of hope for us is that God has not abandoned us. That God is not isolated from us. You know, one of the big questions in the Old Testament for the people, one of the kind of big theology questions they wrestled with um, was where is God? Because in the, the, the Old Testament, and especially for the people of Israel, God's presence was confined to the temple. That quite literally, they believed uh, that he kind of lived in a space that's probably about the size of the stage we have here. Um, you know, 16 by 16, give or take. Um, the space in the center of the temple in Jerusalem. That uh, that is where God, you know, was living, hanging out. And, and literally, if you wanted to see his presence, you would go in there, but not anywhere one could. You had to do all of these rituals to get there. And so when the temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 587 and then rebuilt um, in the time of Nehemiah, the big question for the people was, okay, we got the temple back, but when is God's presence going to come back into the temple? What's going to happen to God's presence when the temple was destroyed? And so these are the big theological questions that the people are wrestling with and the answers uh, from the prophets all throughout the Old Testament is that God's presence isn't confined to brick and mortar space like the temple. And I think the same word for you and I is that God's presence isn't confined to Sundays at 11 o'clock in the gym and the sanctuary over at Moody Methodist Church and absent from us uh, the rest of the week. Right, That same God whose grace we send each other out with Uh, every week through communion and in our benediction, uh, that same God is still present with us and still working in the midst of our coronavirus COVID-19 crisis. Uh, That God, we believe, is still working in us and with us. So we're invited to be patient, we're invited to be hopeful, um, but how do we reach uh, each other and really feel that hope, right? How do we make this hope we were invited into a reality? Well, here's the third thing, and this is probably the most important. Um, If you've been also looking at Reddit or something on your phone today, uh, just for like five minutes, set that down, and just if you get one thing today, let it be this. Um, God invites us to be present. God invites us uh, to have patience. God invites us into his presence and to have hope. But in the meantime, we are invited to be a blessing. Uh, Look here in uh, verses 5, 6, and 7, what God invites the people to do. In verse 5, he tells them to build houses and live in them, to plant gardens, to eat what they produce, to take wives and have sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, right? Have grandkids so that they may bear sons and daughters, have great grandkids, and so on and so forth. Multiply there and do not decrease. So that what God is inviting the people to do is to settle into their situation. It could be tempting for them to withdraw and retreat and just hang out, you know, those of them from Israel in kind of a holy huddle and and not have any contact in any way with one another. But God says, no, get out there and invest in the city. But this is the key verse, verse 7. Underline this verse in your Bible. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Israel was invited to settle down, to cultivate gardens, to have kids and grandkids and great-grandkids, to grow and eat the food that they grow, to get married. But they were invited to do so 
for the sake of the community around them. They were invited not to live at a people who could dip out at any moment, um, who have one foot out the door, who have their mind on something else. But they were invited to invest in that community and to be a blessing to one another. Uh, I love that line, to seek the welfare of the city, for in its behalf uh, you will find your welfare, right? In its welfare you will find your welfare. Now we, as you know, can't be present in the way that God is inviting them to do in this text. Uh, We can't gather physically with one another um, in large groups. And we should listen to the advisement of groups like the CDC and World Health Organization and other groups and, um, you know, separate ourselves physically. But just because we can't be present with one another, it doesn't mean we still cannot bless one another in this congregation and in this larger community. Um, we can still call and check in with one another. Uh, We as a staff are working on calling and connecting with all of you. Uh, The prophet's invitation was to build houses and uh, have some kids, but maybe his invitation to us would be to cook a meal and take it uh, to one of your neighbors. Um, I don't know about you, but I've met more of my neighbors in the last two weeks than I have in the last couple of years. Maybe that's the same for you, because as we are walking around in our neighborhood more, we're running into people that we've not realized have lived in the same neighborhood that we have for, um, you know, decades and weeks and months. Um, But maybe that there's someone in your neighborhood who it's not um, especially not safe or advised for them to go out, and, and you can be a blessing to them by picking up groceries on their behalf, by bringing a meal to them. Um, by just visiting with them from a safe and appropriate distance, maybe over the telephone. There are lots of creative ways that God is calling us to be a blessing to one another. It's our temptation to withdraw and to retreat and to be reactive, but I think in this time of coronavirus and COVID-19, God is calling us to reach out. To not be reactive, but to be proactive in our community. And certainly we should follow all of the safe guidelines of, again, groups like the CDC, the World Health Organizations, um, key scientists and leaders who are working on this and leading us in this effort. But this is not a time for us to retreat and be reactive. This is a time for us to push forward and to be proactive in that belief we have that God is still doing something in our midst. Now I'm sad that we can't come and have communion uh, together, uh, but we can still take a moment to share in the remembrance of that meal. And that through God's mighty power, I truly believe that the grace that God makes available in our taking of that meal, uh, God is making available to us through our need to be Uh, online and remote. Uh, But again, I want to share a bit of the the communion liturgy and story that we tell every Sunday um, to share in that moment. And then we'll together, I want to invite you after that uh, to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, We remember when we gather together online and around this table and all of the tables that we're gathered around, that on the night in which our Lord gave himself up for us, he took bread and broke it, giving thanks to you, saying, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you, uh, to eat this meal in remembrance of me. Uh, After the supper was over, he took the cup, and he said to his disciples, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from this, all of you often as you can, and do so in remembrance of me. And so we pray together, Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, on us gathered in each of our unique locations this morning, and to all of us who will be watching this video maybe later in the week, pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us and on the gift of bread and cup that we cannot take today. Uh, But we pray that your spirit 
is with us and continuing to empower us to be your church, to reach out to one another and to be a blessing in whatever safe way that we can. Uh, now I want to invite you to say with me the Lord's Prayer. Um, if you don't know it, the words will come down at the bottom of your screen here. Uh, but it goes like this. Uh, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Oh, you love 
As we conclude our service of online worship, uh, I'm going to invite you to one of our practices of our benediction as we cup our hands together as we receive this benediction from God this morning. Um, but friends, as we go uh, from this browser, right, this Facebook page, uh, this website we're watching from, um, but as we go from whatever place we're at in the spirit and love of our Lord this morning, uh, let us go remembering that God invites us to be patient uh, to be hopeful, uh, but most of all, to be a blessing to one another um, in the midst of this unique time we find ourselves in. Amen. Uh, friends, go in peace. <laughs>